What is up engine heads? Today we're talking about bearing clearances. We'll explain what they are, why they're important and how to measure them. When we speak about bearing clearance on an engine, we're usually referring to the clearance between the crankshaft rod journal and the rod bearing, as well as the clearance between the crankshaft main journal and the main bearing. You probably know that the key parts of your rotating assembly are never supposed to make contact with each other. Instead, there's a film of oil between your crankshaft journals and your rod and main bearings. The bearing clearance determines the thickness of the oil film and thus plays a key part in your oil pressure and oil temperatures. If the clearance is too tight, metal-to-metal -metal contact can occur under loads and during crankshaft flexing, and in most cases this will result in damage and engine failure. On the other hand, clearances that are too loose will make it difficult for your oil pump to maintain desired oil pressure, and will also result in too much oil coming out from the sides of the bearings, which will increase crankcase windage and reduce power a bit. Obviously, clearances on the loose side carry less risk, but it's always best to aim for a clearance which is neither too loose nor too tight, but just right for your particular application. Now, the right clearance depends a lot on the type of engine and its modifications, and there really is no one-size-fits-all formula. However, there is a bit of a rule of thumb, and this is the rule of thumb. It's 0.001 times your journal diameter. It doesn't matter if it's inches or millimeters. For example, our engine right here is a second generation Toyota 4A FE 16 valve engine with 48mm main journals and 40mm rod journals. And our rule of thumb tells us that our main bearing clearance is thus 48 times 0.001, which equals to 0.048mm of main bearing clearance. In the same way, our rod bearing clearance is 40 times 0.001, which equals to 0.04mm. So we can call this here our rule of thumb bearing clearance, but if we check our factory service manual, we will see that it recommends tighter bearing clearances than this. Now this isn't a very modern engine, but you will see that many modern engines do run tighter stock clearances than what our rule of thumb would recommend. Now there's a whole science behind tight versus loose clearance, and we will cover that in a future video, but for now what I can tell you is that if I were to rebuild this engine in its stock form, I would aim for somewhere around the middle or top half of what the factory service manual recommends. But if I were to rebuild this engine in a significantly modified form, for example by adding force induction or increasing the red line by a few thousand RPM, I would aim for the rule of thumb clearance. Now let's proceed to measure our bearing clearance, but before we do that we will do a quick visual inspection of our crankshaft journals and bearing surfaces. Here we have two used Toyota 4A crankshafts, one of which is in good condition and another one which is in horrible condition, you can probably already tell which is which. Obviously this crankshaft immediately fails visual inspection. It actually spun two rod bearings and as you can see it has very noticeable deep scoring on the rod journals. The main journals are a bit better, but they're not ideal either. Basically, when you run your nail across the journal surface, if you can feel scratches and if they snag your nail, then the crankshaft fails visual inspection and there's no need to measure anything. Instead, it's best to take a crankshaft like this to a machine shop to see if it can be saved by regrinding or if it's destined for the scrap heap. Our other crankshaft has good journals that are nice and shiny and there's nothing to be felt with our fingernail. The same logic applies to the bearing surfaces. Smooth and shiny like this passes visual inspection. On the other hand, deep scratches and embedded particles as you can see here fail visual inspection. You can probably easily tell which of our cranks came from which of these blocks. Now these bearings do display some signs of uneven wear, but this is very mild and it doesn't raise any red flags. In fact, this engine likely had a bearing reset at some point as it was a very high mileage engine with a lot of blow by and on the other hand these bearings look practically new and there's almost no wear on them, which suggests that they have been replaced at some point likely with the engine still in the car. Now we can start our measuring. To do this we will need two tools, a micrometer and a dial bore gauge. 
As you can see, I'm using my very affordable bank good tools for this, and they may be unsuitable for continuous professional use, but they are absolutely perfect for enthusiasts. They give you accurate measurements and an insight into the currencies inside your engine, which means that you don't have to just blindly leave everything to the machine shop and hope for the best. If you're a DIY car enthusiast, I think it's definitely a good idea to have a set of these and learn the skill of accurately measuring important currencies inside your engine. If you want to pick up a set of these, there's links down below. In order to measure things accurately, we need to zero our tools. If you want to see how that's done, I suggest that you watch my previous video where I explain this in more detail. Links are in the suggested card and the description as well. To make measuring easier, we can set the crankshaft on four main caps and apply a bit of oil to them to make turning the crankshaft easier. We're going to start by measuring our rod journals. We do this by gently moving the micrometer across the journal as we tighten down the small knob at the same time. The small knob or ratchet ensures that consistent and equal pressure is applied which results in consistent, accurate and repeatable measurements. The goal is simply to make contact with the journal, not to over tighten anything. The micrometer should still be able to slide on and off the journal with just a bit of effort. You will feel a bit of resistance but it will be low. You can measure at any spot as long as it isn't at or near an oiling hole. After you have found the measurement on one side or half of the journal, you can lock your micrometer and measure other parts to check for taper and out of round. First we'll measure at both sides or both halves of the journal. Simply slide the micrometer onto the other half or the other side of the journal and observe the resistance. If it slides on and off from this spot the same way it did from our previous spot, then there is no taper in the journal. Next, we're going to measure at an angle of 90 degrees or perpendicular to our first two measuring locations. Actually, at this spot, the micrometer felt a bit tighter, so I decided not to force it to prevent damaging the crankshaft. I retook the measurement here and found a very slight out of round condition, somewhere around 0.05 millimeters, which is well below the maximum out of round allowed according to the factory service manual. That being said, this is a somewhat generous out of round and taper allowance, and I'm personally not comfortable reusing a crankshaft if it has more than 0.01 millimeters of taper or out of round. When it comes to the main journals, we will do the same thing as with the rod journals. Measure at both journal halves and then perpendicular to these two locations. We will again get our first measurement and then slide the micrometer on and off the other locations to see if it feels any looser or tighter on the other spots. Again, we will take the same precautions and avoid oiling holes and we will not force the micrometer onto the crankshaft if it feels too tight. And here we have our measurements. They are definitely within spec and don't raise any red flags. I did notice a very small amount of taper on the main journal, but it was barely detectable with my micrometer, which means that it's safe to ignore it. Now that we have our journal dimensions, we can go ahead and measure our main and rod bearing bores. We're going to start with the main bearings. To do this, we obviously need to have the bearings installed and then we'll torque down the main cap using the correct torque specifications. After we have done that, we'll zero our dial bore gauge. Since our main journal size is 48 millimeters, that's what we will set as our zero. Again, there are detailed instructions on how to do this in my dial bore gauge video. Once we have zeroed our gauge, we will measure at six different locations. We measure by moving the bore gauge gently back and forth and observing the furthest point reached by the needle. The first and most important location is a vertical measurement perpendicular to the bearing parting line. The value obtained at this measuring location is the value we will be using for our bearing clearance. As you can see here, our measurement is 48.06 millimeters. Our zero is 48 and everything before it is how much the bore is larger than 48 millimeters. Each individual line on our gauge face represents 0.01 millimeters. Next, we'll measure at about 48 degrees away from the vertical axis on both sides. This is merely a control measure and it shows how much eccentricity there is in the bearing. All bearings have some eccentricity incorporated in them as this benefits lubrication and how exactly that works is something we can talk about in future videos. But for now, we can observe that there is around 0.01 millimeters of eccentricity in our case. Usually the eccentricity value will be low and it will differ from engine to engine. It's best to check your factory service manual to see just how much eccentricity is normal for your engine. 
Once we are done with these measurements, we'll repeat the same three measurements on the back of the bearing. Usually when a bearing is in good shape and shows no abnormal wear, measurements will be equal at the back and at the front of the bearing. Now we can proceed to measure our rod bearing bore. Of course, we do this with the rod caps torqued down to spec and we measure at the same spots as with the main bearings. Just like with main bearings, we do not measure at or near the parting lines of the bearing or at or near oiling holes. Instead, we measure perpendicular to the bearing parting line and at around 45 degrees from the vertical axis. Since the rod bearings don't have a groove like the main bearings, we can also measure at the middle of the bearing as well as at the front and at the back of the bearing. However, if the bearing looks good and shows no signs of abnormal or increased wear on one side, there is no need to measure at the center and you can only measure at the front and at the back. And here we have all of our journal and our bearing bore measurements. To get our bearing clearance value, we're going to deduct our vertical axis bearing bore measurement from our largest journal measurement. The result is our bearing clearance. Of course, this is just the bearing clearance of one main bearing and one rod bearing, and you need to repeat this whole procedure for every bearing inside the engine. As you can see, we are definitely on the loose side, but we are below of the limit of what's acceptable inside this engine. If I were to do a quick budget friendly rebuild of this engine, I would simply get the largest possible main bearing and the largest possible rod bearing to push our clearance closer to a more acceptable range. The only slight concern is that we do not have that many rod bearing sizes available and our bearing clearance of the rods is a bit closer to the limit than our uh, main bearings. So this is a slight concern, but likely this engine would do many, many more trouble free miles as this is below the limit. And that's pretty much it when it comes to bearing clearance basics. In our future videos, we'll talk about tight versus loose bearing clearances in performance builds, as well as bearing construction, materials, and other interesting stuff. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it informative. As always, thanks a lot for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4A channel.